David was sharing with me this morning what he was going to be speaking about, and uh, and it just happened to connect with a song that uh, Josie and I had just wrote and recorded uh, on the prodigal son. That's the parable he's going to be sharing about. So that's where this song is coming from. Accept these filthy rags. I offer them, they're all I have. Would you dare to touch my gaping sores? Could you take me in your arms? Could you still call me yours? Would you accept such a messed up life? When I've lived for myself, full of envy and pride Could you bear to look on my dirty mind? Would you make it pure and whole? Could it be your home? I could make it and exposed to the one who knows all I With every soul stain I chose, I met you ashamed and broken. There are no facades, I'm done running from God. Accept me as I come, diseased and dying, so undone. Nothing to offer, I'm a vagabond, just a prodigal, needing your love. You know I've tried to mend my own ways and tried to hide my filth. In your disgrace Lord, I'm so ashamed Yet I seek your face I'm longing for a change Make me work your grace I can make it and exposed To the one who knows all I am With every soul stain I chose I'm wretched, ashamed, and broken. There are no facades. I'm done running from God. I'm tired of trying to heal myself, Lord. To cover my rags with the guise of wealth. Tired of trying to live like I'm alive The truth is I'm dying inside I come naked and exposed To the one who knows all I am With every soul stain I chose I'm wretched, ashamed and broken there are no facades I'm done running from God I'm longing for home So I will arise And go to Jesus All right, good morning, everyone. Feeling very royal this morning. I have to let you know, life is filled with these wonderful little ironies. Um, this morning, I needed to get uh, a document printed that has this uh, parable. It'll become clear later in the presentation. But um, I really needed to get it printed, and, and Rose and I were running around sort of trying to find the best place to get it printed, and we were able to get it printed in uh, Bob Kite's office. And... Um, 
So I went in there and introduced myself to him, and he said, oh, you know, nice to meet you. Been enjoying the week of prayer. I said, great, you know, so what do you do here? I'm the president of Adventist Risk Management. I said, great, I'm glad I have very little to do with you. Um, I know very little about what you do and, and hope to know even less. And uh, he said, oh, by the way, he said, um, were you skateboarding last night in the parking lot? <laughs> Who's asking? <laughs> I said, yeah, actually, I, I, I was sort of skateboarding through your parking lot last night. He said, yeah, I almost ran you over. <laughs> Not kidding at all. Just going right in front, just going really fast on uh, Frank let me borrow his board last night just for a bit. He makes these beautiful skateboards. And um, sure enough, this SUV comes in and, and I was like, oh, I really hope I don't get run over. And uh, he didn't, I mean, he's a very capable driver. I just want to emphasize the excellence <laughs> of his superb carmanship. But um, the irony that uh, it would be the president of Adventist Risk Management, almost running me over at the General Conference headquarters while I'm on a skateboard in the middle of the night, right? So, yeah, and, and then for the Lord to put that little thing together, like, why should I end up in his office this morning? I don't know if it's, Bob, I don't know if that was for you or me. I don't know what Jesus was doing there, but uh, something happening there. It's been awesome to be here this week. I have had the, the time of my life Yesterday, I single-handedly kept the White Estate from accomplishing anything. <laughs> so I just, I, I just want you to know, uh, for those of you that wonder, um, you know, if, if they show on their little worksheets, if they have to do them, you know, this day was just a loss. It was my fault. Um, I was down there and uh, just totally occupied Jim's time, and then I occupied Tim's time, and then I occupied Daryl's time, and then I occupied Cindy's time. So um, I feel kind of good about myself, you know, just wandering place to place, keeping people from their work. Um, there's a sort of sadistic satisfaction associated with that. So um, what I'd like to do in, this morning in our message, this is just a message that I'm so excited about, and it is not at all a diversion from what we've been discussing. We've been looking at uh, largely the Sermon on the Mount. We sort of walked through the Beatitudinal sequence yesterday, and we did note yesterday that the kingdom that Jesus came to introduce, the very first thing he said, of course, were, was, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs what? You know this. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom that Jesus was introducing, we, we just touched on this, was radically different from the kingdom associations that the disciples would have had. And we just mentioned that the kingdom language itself is probably liable to misunderstanding, just by the nature of the language. And uh, we know that the disciples... Um, had both pre, during, and post Jesus' uh, walk with them and time with them uh, significant misunderstandings about the kingdom. It would only come after Jesus' ascension and frankly after the stoning of Stephen that it would become increasingly clear to the disciples the nature of the kingdom that Jesus was advocating. Now in uh, the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing which is a personal favorite and I just want to thank uh, uh, Tim yesterday from the White Estate. There's a statement that I have been, and many of us have these experiences, where there's just a statement in the spirit of prophecy, and we know it's there. And we've heard it before, and we might have even quoted it, but we can't find the reference. And when you type it into the CD-ROM, you're using the wrong word or the wrong language, and it's just eluded me for the longest time. So I said to Tim yesterday, I said, Tim, are you familiar with the statement where Ellen White says, da 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 And he says, oh, yeah. I mean, the guy's a polymath. He's an absolute, oh, yeah, that's in da 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 I just stood in awe. It was like, oh. He just knew, literally. I mean, I've been looking for this thing for years. And he's like, oh, yeah, of course. That's, uh, you know, that I may know him, page, I think it was 338. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> amazing. So here's an amazing statement. Uh, th this is one of the ones that I wanted to really bring to bear here. She says, uh, of the poor in spirit, Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom is not as Christ hears had hoped. So there's the expectations that we talked about, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. This kingdom is not, as Christ hears had hoped, a temporal and earthly dominion. Christ was opening to men the spiritual kingdom. And then she gives three modifying words. Christ was opening to men the, the, the spiritual kingdom. So what kind of a kingdom is it? It's a spiritual kingdom. Matthew would say the kingdom of heaven. That's an exclusively Matthean term. We don't find that in Mark, Luke, or John. In them, it's the kingdom of God. There's reasons for that, which are kind of interesting. But here she just calls it the spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, most are going to tell you, are synonymous. They're interchangeable here. So listen, she gives three modifying words here. 
Christ was opening to men the spiritual kingdom of his love, his grace, and his righteousness. This is how she defines the spiritual kingdom. Three modifying words. Okay, his love, his grace, and his righteousness. Okay, so what are the three words? What, this kingdom of heaven that Jesus is advocating is his love, his grace, and his righteousness. Does that sound anything like, for example, the kingdom of the United States of America? I mean, this kingdom is founded on some fantastic principles, some fantastic principles. And as those principles are properly executed, it can be a reasonably good kingdom, for earth, as far as earthly kingdoms go. We just had a whole parade, a pageant here, of various kingdoms that are set upon various principles, various, various governing systems, various political systems, various economic systems, and social idiosyncrasies. But, but Jesus' kingdom is, what are the three words? Set on his love, his grace and his right what a strange seemingly strange thing to build a kingdom upon his love his grace and his righteousness no wonder Jesus had to employ such unusual metaphors to disabuse the kingdom language of its necessary liabilities that the disciples would have associated it with they would have associated it with Rome and power and strength and puissance and and might and even breadth and width and height and depth. And Jesus says, it's a little different than that. It's like a mustard seed. A what? A mustard seed. It's like yeast. All right. Yeast. We advocate the yeasty kingdom. It's like a net. So Jesus employed this phrase over and over again. The kingdom of heaven is like... I find very few instances in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John where Jesus ever says the kingdom of heaven or in the other gospels, the kingdom of God is a thing. Is this thing. He, he more often than not says the kingdom of heaven is like and he uses the most unusual reference. Um, here we are in a very cosmopolitan and many of you are peripatetic. We are, we're all over the world and so we have an awareness ...of the breadth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Many of us in this room, of course, you would expect that here at the General Conference World Headquarters. You know, I've not even been to India, but this morning I'm dressed like a North Indian prince. But there's an appropriateness here because I love Indian food. It is my very favorite food. Um, uh, and there are several close seconds, don't get me wrong. But, uh, but the point here is basically this. For many people who have not traveled much... ...they begin to take on a very parochial and even sometimes a myopic view of the world. I remember one time I was in Michigan. I had the privilege of working in Michigan for seven years. Great conference, great leadership, great people. And, but there is a sort of insularity in Michigan that uh, people will say things like this. I'll give you a good example. I was out fly fishing one day on a, the Asabo River. I met this guy and uh, we got to discussing and I said, oh, where are you from? And he says in classical Michiganian uh, you know, way, he says... Oh, I'm, 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 I've lived all over. Oh, I said, where? He says, oh, I've lived in the Grand Rapids. I was like, oh, yeah. He says, Battle Creek. I was like, yeah. He says, I've, I've been up in Mackinac. I was like, oh, okay. So, so for my friend there on the river that day fly fishing, he has lived all over. I mean, he's lived all over. And if you ever got to the, you know, Ohio border or, you know, heaven forbid, the Wisconsin border over on the other side of the UP, it's like the earth just ends, right? It just ends. For those of us who don't have quite as narrow a view of the world and who have seen other things, for the culture that we grow up in, the culture that we're accustomed to, for me, that would be sort of, you know, middle America. I'm from Wyoming, a little town in Cheyenne. I was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Anybody here been to Cheyenne, Wyoming? Whoa! I am at the general conference. Okay. <laughs> Has anyone here been to Laramie, Wyoming? Oh, man, I am at the General Conference. Okay. So I was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I was born again in Laramie, Wyoming. I am a son of Wyoming. It's just my heart and soul. Everything is really wrapped up with Wyoming. So for me, the, the life that I have, the, the things that I am associated with, the things that you are associated with, when we travel to another culture, to another place that's radically different from what we are accustomed to, particularly for the first, second, or third time, when we then go back to the culture that we're accustomed to, it can be difficult, problematic, to describe to them what that place is like. Does that make sense? Uh, how many of us here have been to Mongolia? Okay, a few of us. I went to Mongolia. I had the privilege of going there about four years ago. Maybe it was five years ago. And uh, when you go to Mongolia, it's not like going to a place. It's like going back in time. 
about a thousand years. There are no roads in that country outside of Ulaanbaatar. I mean, there, it's just a great big swath of land about the size, I think, of the state of Texas. And there are no roads. There are very few fences. It was just people, if you, if you w went to most people and said, okay, you can have a brand new SUV, Land Cruiser, you know, inline uh, six-cylinder diesel, or you can have this beautiful horse. Oh, to take the horse, of course. Because the horse, um, you don't have to put gas in it. It eats the grass, which is absolutely ubiquitous there. And then it produces the most wonderful drink, Irag. You know, fermented mare's milk. Mmm. <laughs> Let me tell you. So, apparently, it's the last horse. Didn't try it, by the way. Couldn't bring myself to do it. <laughs> and I'm sure it's excellent if there's any Mongolians here. No offense. Uh, but the point is this. Last horse-based society in the world. So when I came back from Mongolia, and people said, what was it like? Um, it was unlike anything in our country. Because what happens is, is that the more disparate, the, 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 the greater the difference between what you're accustomed to and what you have been exposed to, the harder it is to find reference, points of attachment between cultures. Does that make sense? Can be difficult. Now think of Jesus. Jesus comes from heaven. He wasn't from, he wasn't from Nazareth. He was incarnate there and he lived there and he breathed there, but he was from heaven. And Jesus comes from heaven, and in the kingdom of heaven, what were those three things? The kingdom, the spiritual kingdom is based on his love, his grace, and his righteousness. And he comes down to these people who have these expectations of a kingdom, and all of their reference for kingdom and kingdom language and kingdom ideas and kingdom concepts are going to be based upon earthly ideas and earthly concepts. You see, Jesus didn't just go to Mongolia or to India or to some other place that was separated by geography. He went to a place that was separated in so many ways, not just geographically, not just in terms of distance, but in terms of the basic way that heaven works versus the way that earth works. And he came and he wanted to try and explain to us, this is how heaven operates. Heaven is totally different than what you're accustomed to. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And then he has to explain, what an unusual referent for a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. What an unusual referent for a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. What an unusual... And we find this all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. I think he employs some seven or eight, might even be more, might, might, might be approaching ten. The kingdom of heaven is like parables. What I'd like to do this morning is walk you through what I think is the most difficult of those. The most difficult of those the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's found in Matthew chapter 20. So if you join me there in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew... This is very much in keeping with our theme on the kingdom of heaven in your life today. Now, Matthew chapter, what chapter are we going to, everyone? 20. And uh, in order to understand Matthew chapter 20, which begins, of course, let's look at those words. Beginning in verse 1, what are the first, what's the first phrase there? For the kingdom of heaven is what? What phrase are we expecting? Like. For the kingdom of heaven is like. And he goes on to give the parable that we're going to look at in just a moment. But before we get into Matthew chapter 20... We're going to do something very responsible and just very commonsensical. We're going to look at the context. We're going to look at the what, everyone? So, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 19 because there are two events that set this parable up. Two events that set this parable up and they are remarkable in their similarity. The first, of course, is Jesus' encounter with the rich, young, what? Ruler. Now, we don't know his name, so we're just going to call him Rich. Okay? So, Jesus' encounter with Rich. We'll pick it up in verse 16. It says, now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So a simple question here. As Rich approaches Jesus, what is he after? What's he, what does he want? Based on that text, what does he want? He wants eternal life, okay? So he approaches, hey, hey, good teacher, good master. Hey, in your opinion, from your perspective, from your rabbinical perspective, what do I have to do to attain, to have eternal life? Jesus' response is probably not a response that the rich young ruler was anticipating. Verse 17, why do you call me good? He puts it on the horns here of a, of a real dilemma. Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. The rich young ruler is now totally confused, but he manages to ask a question. Which ones? Which one? Hey, good teacher, good master, I'm just wondering, from your rabbinical perspective, what do I have to do to have eternal life? He says, uh, you know, I have just a quick question here before we get into the conversation. Why are you calling me good? 
Are you flattering me? Why do you call me good? Only one is good, and that is God. I suppose if you are calling me good, then you're effectively calling me God, but that's another conversation. Keep the commandments. All right. Which ones? Watch what Jesus does. Stroke of pastoral brilliance here. He begins with, you shall not murder. Now, he's quoting here directly from the Ten Commandments. Uh, you shall not murder. Which number in terms of the, the commandments is that? You shall not murder. We should know this. That's number one, two, three, six. Very good. And then you shall not commit adultery is number seven. You shall not steal is number. You shall not bear false witness is number. Now, what would you expect to come next? Right? What commandments, what, how do I enter into eternal life? Keep the commandments. And then he basically says, which ones? And he says, oh, six, seven, eight, nine. What would you just expect? If you didn't know the next verse and you had to guess, remember those, uh, those little things that we used to have to do when we were young, you know, follow the pattern? The pattern is one, three, five, seven, nine. Right? You had to do, so what would you expect here? Six, seven, eight, nine. What would you expect? Ten. And what is the tenth commandment? Thou shalt not. Covet, and covetousness is what? It, what does it have to do with? Thou shalt, it has to do with stuff, right? It has to do with greed, an inordinate desire for material things. So you would expect Jesus to say, oh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But he does something totally wonderful here, radical. He skips ten, swings back to five, and then summarizes the commandments from Leviticus. Verse 19, honor your father and your mother. Which commandment is that? Five, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he's quiet. I mean, this is awesome. The rich young ruler, who as we're going to discover, who's, what was his struggle? In a word, in a sentence, what was the struggle of the rich young ruler? It was greed. It was covetousness. It was for money. And so he approached, hey, what do I have to do to keep, oh, you know, why do you call me good? Keep the commandments. Which ones? Oh, six, seven, eight, nine, five. How is the rich young ruler feeling right now? Of course, he would have known the law every bit as good as and probably better than any of us in this room. He still manages the strength to affirm what Jesus has said here. But you notice that he's under conviction in verse 20. The young man said to him, oh. <laughs> All these I have kept from my youth. But look at this question. He, 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 he betrays the condition of his heart. What do I still lack? He knew he was missing something. Jesus had not unintentionally or, or neglectfully missed the 10th commandment. Is, is there anything I'm missing? Oh, Jesus says, oh, wonderful, wonderful. I have a proposition for you. If you want to be perfect, go and what does he say to him? Verse 21, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, this invitation to follow me is an invitation to discipleship. And Ellen White confirms this. This is not just any ordinary run-of-the-mill invitation. Follow me is the same invitation to, to uh, uh, Peter, uh, James, and John on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, why does Jesus say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men to Peter, James, and John? Why does he say that? Because they were fishermen. Now, who is the rich young ruler? Well, we don't know much about him, but he was obviously entrepreneurially minded. He's a businessman. He's a businessman. And so Jesus doesn't say to the businessman, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Because that's not his language. When he speaks to the businessman, he says, oh, follow me and you will have what? What, what is the language of a businessman? It's money. It's commerce. It's, 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 it's exchange. He says, follow me and you will have what? Treasure in heaven. And there is a brilliant little pastoral lesson in this. And that is that we have to actually speak the language of the people. If we are saying, and we might be preaching the truth, we might be preaching the Adventist message, but if people's language and the, the, the fluidity of language has so changed that what made fantastic sense linguistically 30 years ago, if we preach those same messages today, we might not be saying something that people are even hearing. This is why the, the Adventist truth is non-negotiable. The, the Bible message is non-negotiable. But the packaging of that message has to change so that we can be sure we're saying what we want the people to hear. Are we together? To me, this is just common sense. If we stand up and we use evangelistic methods and methodologies and, and ministerial approaches from the 1950s and 60s and people aren't resonating with it, we shouldn't try to do that more and throw more, more money at evangelistic enterprises that are 40 years old. We should ask ourselves the question, what is the language that people are speaking today? 
How would we communicate the biblical message in today's language? In Jesus, he communicates it. He speaks to fishermen, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He's speaking to a, a wealthy man, follow me, I'll, he'll have treasures in heaven. I mean, and Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. I will get, he that drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. She's thirsty. He's speaking the language of the people. Amen? Uh, to me, okay, close parenthesis, just a little pastoral lesson there. Now, this is quite fascinating. He says, all you do, you lack a single thing, sell all that you have, and you can be my disciple. Now watch what happens. But when the, rich, when the young man, when Rich heard this, verse 22, he heard this saying, he went away sorrowful because he had what? He went away sorrowful. He walks away. Now get this picture in your mind's eye. Here goes the rich young ruler, turning away forlornly, walking away and Jesus, as the rich young ruler is walking away, Jesus has something to say because he senses that the disciples are apprehensive about what he has done. The disciples, once again, frankly, think that Jesus has blown it. I mean, look at the sky, Jesus. Look at the resources here. We could use this guy. So the disciples are convinced that Jesus has made a mistake. Jesus anticipates this. And so as the rich young ruler is walking away, Jesus says, assuredly, he, he, I'm telling you absolutely, it is hard for a rich man to enter, here we go, here's our phrase, the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, <laughs> wait a minute. In first century context, what Jesus has just said here is absurd. Totally absurd. Jesus just said it's hard for a healthy, wealthy Jew to be saved. Are you kidding First of all, he's a Jew, so he's in right relationship with God because of his genealogical relationship to Abraham. Then he's healthy, which is proof positive that he's under the favor of God. And he happens to be wealthy, which is doubly proof positive that he's under the favor of God. So Jesus just said, in the hearing of his disciples, it's hard, oh, it's tough for a healthy, wealthy Jew to be saved. And the disciples are perfectly incredulous. Peter, in classic Peterine fashion, speaks up on behalf of everyone else. Look at what he says. Verse 25, the disciples, when they heard this, they were, what does your Bible say? They were, they were, they weren't just astonished. No, 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 no. They were what? Greatly astonished. You could just like, what? They're looking at the rich young ruler walk away. And what are they thinking? If it's hard for a healthy, wealthy Jew to be saved, well, I got the healthy part and I got the Jewish part, but I don't got the wealthy part. So then they turn to Jesus and they ask it with great insecurity, who then could be saved? Do you see the nature of their question? If it's hard for a healthy, wealthy Jew to be saved, who then could be saved? And then Jesus says in verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And we throw this verse around everywhere. We just throw it around. We say, oh, I had a flat tire and right on the side of the road. It magically filled up with air. It's a miracle from God. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. We just take this verse and we allocate it, you know. I, the toaster wasn't even plugged in. And the Lord so wanted me to be on time that my toast came up. And listen, maybe God did toast your toast. I don't know. <laughs> but, but that's not... This verse is saying... Look at it here. It says, with men, this is impossible. And in context, what is this? The salvation of a man. Now, to me, this is another profound articulation of the great truth of righteousness by faith. No man can save himself. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Are we together, everyone? Now look at this. Here we go. Then Peter answered and said to him, here we go. Classic, pendulous, Peterine uh, articulation here. Here we go. Then Peter answered and said to him, see, I love this. See, he's inviting the omniscient one to observe something. See, he says. Jesus, perhaps something had escaped your notice. See, see, we have left all and followed you. And then here's the critical word, the operative word. Therefore, on the basis of this is what that word means. We have, look at Jesus, they're greatly disturbed by what they've seen with the walking away of rich. And so they turn to Jesus and they say, because they're insecure right now. They know that they're Jews and they know that they're healthy, but this wealthy thing has really got them stirred up. And Jesus just said it's hard for a healthy, wealthy Jew to be saved. And so in their great insecurity, they turn to Jesus, or Peter turns to Jesus and says, uh, see, look at this boat, Jesus. I mean, it was... I mean, it wasn't the latest and greatest model, but I mean, I couldn't afford the leather seats, but at least it's got the cloth. I mean, look at this. I left it behind. Therefore, and this is the operative word, because he's basically saying, I have done this, 
What do you do in response? Therefore, what shall we have? Do you see the significance of this, everyone? Yes or no? Do you see it? Now, here's the amazing, amazing point. Matt, can I just borrow you very quickly? Just, if you could just run up here. Um, I need something. That water bottle would be great. I'll be right back. Sorry, just props, you know, you need these things. Okay, so check this out. Matt's Jesus, okay? Jesus has access to something that the rich young ruler believes Jesus has access to, eternal life. Okay, so we're going to use the water bottle to represent, I'm the rich young ruler, I come and I, I look great. The rich young ruler says, essentially, you have access to something that I want, how do I get that thing? I want that thing. And the rich young ruler, being a businessman, being entrepreneurially minded, believes that this is going to work like any business transaction. What do I do? What service do I provide? What do I say? How much do I pay? What do I render to you so that you give me that? Right? So let's just say it's this. We'll just say this represents something that I'm giving. And so look at this. It's very simple. Ah, you see that? This is capitalism in, right? Ah, you see that? So I'm giving something. And I am getting something proportionate to what I've given. Does that make sense? Okay, now, you think, oh, of course, he's the rich young ruler. He's, trying to, he's essentially taking a business perspective as he approaches Jesus. But Peter does the same thing. Now I'm Peter. Now I'm Peter. And Peter just saw Rich walk away. And he says, well, I don't have the Cadillac Escalade, but I have this boat. See, see. We have left all and followed you. What do we get? He didn't expect to get as much as the rich young ruler. He just wanted to know what would, he would get based on what he was giving. Because he believed that his reward would be proportionate to what he'd given. Does this make sense? So both the rich young ruler and, G, both the rich young ruler and Peter have an essentially economic view of salvation. Or at least an economic view, to be very precise, of how God interacts with humanity. I will give you something, you will respond in kind. Are we together, everyone here? Now, thank you so much, Matt. It is in this context that Jesus then says in Matthew chapter 20, and now we're at Matthew chapter 20, it is in this context that Jesus says, fellas, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. For the kingdom of heaven, I'm in verse 1, is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour, that's nine o'clock, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour, that's noon, and the ninth hour, that's three, and did likewise. At about the eleventh hour, that's five o'clock, he went out and found others standing idle, and he said to them, why have you been here idle all day? And they said to him, oh, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. Okay, so this is an easy parable to understand. Okay, so Jesus says, fellas, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like a guy, of, of, an employer, who went out into the market and he hired people at 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay, and then he said, hey, you guys want a job? Oh yeah, we're really looking for a job. Great, this is my vineyard, go work in my vineyard. And then he went out three hours later at 9 o'clock. And he said, hey, you guys looking for a job? You're looking for some work? Got up a little late, didn't you? Yeah, but we'd really like some work. Great, go work in my vineyard. So he sends them out to work in his vineyard. Then he goes out at noon. Hey, uh, some of you are here on lunch break, but is anybody looking for a job? Oh, you guys are looking for a job? Go work in my vineyard. He goes out at 3, and he goes out at 5. This is where we get the phrase 11th hour worker from. He goes out at 5. And so he has, he has these, um, these employees that have been working various uh, times in the day. And the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is analogous to this. Jesus says that this is, this is an analogy for the kingdom of heaven. Now, as the workday comes to a conclusion, he says to his steward, pay everybody, but line them up in reverse order of how I had hired them. Okay, so now they're lined up. One-hour workers, three-hour workers, six-hour workers, nine-hour workers, 12-hour workers. We together, everyone? So they, they start getting paid. Okay, now watch what happens here. Verse 8. It says, uh, or verse 8, so when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the, laborers and be, uh, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first, okay? So here you are, imagine you are standing at the front of the line. You've worked an hour. You didn't even have time to get your run and get your work clothes on, 
Okay, you're, you're in your tie and, you know, whatever. You're in your bazaar, hanging out in the bazaar clothes. So you're standing there, and uh, the person behind the, 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 the steward hands you a day's wage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Um, I think, you know, I think there's a little confusion here. Because you recognize this is a denarius. Um, we only worked an hour. Thank you so much for your work. We really appreciate the hard work that you put in. Looks like you almost broke a sweat. Here's your pays. Here's your day's wage. Oh, you know, thank you. Oh, that's really sweet of you. I'd love to be able to take that. But um, maybe you didn't hear me. We, we only worked an hour. Um, this is a denarius. Thank you so much. God bless you. You need a job. Okay, okay, be a little early tomorrow. Here's your pay. All right. Right? Okay, so they get, and now, now, now put yourself at the back of the line. Now you're at the back of the line. Did you see that, man? Now you're thinking one of two possible things. The one thing you might be thinking is, this guy's got money to burn. He just paid those jokers who, who just got into the field an hour ago a denarius. Yeah. He, what are we going to get? That's what you're thinking. This is what the Bible says. Supposing they would receive more. So, yeah, this guy's got money to burn. Or another possible response would have been, what? A, a bit of an indignation. But you, you choose to just wait and see how things pan out. So here come the three-hour workers. And a little bit of sweat on the brow. And so you step up, and the steward says, here you go. Thank you so much. Hands you a denarius. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Would love to be able to take that. But only work for three hours today, so I'm going to give that back to you. And I just need a fourth of that. Thank you so much for your work today, and uh, maybe we'll see you tomorrow. Here's your day's wage. You sure? Yep. See ya. Okay, so now you're out of there. Now the six-hour workers, denarius. Nine-hour workers, denarius. Now here you come, right, being many of us capitalists, right, Americans. Meritocracy, right? How do we feel? How are we feeling right now? How are we feeling? What's up? Right? And we're not happy. Are we happy? Oh, no, 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 no. We are unhappy because we just saw people. I mean, this is, the, this is like, oh, I better not say that. <laughs> uh, this is unlike our economic system. Um, one hour, day's wage. Three hour, day's wage. Six hour, day's wage. Nine hour, day's wage. And here we are. We've actually worked a day. And thank you so much for your hard work today. Oh, it looks like you tore your jeans there. Thank you. Here, thank you so much for your work. Here's your day's wage. Um, can we talk to the guy that hired us? We're, uh, we're not happy with this. We're going to file a complaint with the union. We are, um... <clears throat> so, so watch what happens. Verse 9. But when those who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. Verse 10. But when the first came, those are the people that worked all day. Look at what it says. They, and what does your Bible say? What's the next word in your Bible? They supposed. Now, give me some synonyms here for what they what? They, they expected, they thought. By the way, it's absolutely analogous to what Peter said when Peter said, we have left all and followed you, therefore, I suppose that we should get X, 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 X. They, they have expectations of how this transaction works. And so it says, they supposed, they believed, they thought, they reasoned, they, raci they, they rationalized, they supposed that they would receive, what does your Bible say? They would receive more. But of course, of course, in, in, in classic capitalist economics, I mean, these, this is a meritocracy here. They supposed that they would receive more. They each received a denarius, verse 11. And when they had uh, received it, they, what did they do? They complained against the landowner, saying, these last, are you joking? These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. And frankly, we resonate with this complaint. Don't you resonate with this complaint? I do. I, I, I see myself at the back of the line, and I'm not happy about this. I resonate with this basic complaint. And I think that there's very few of us in this room that wouldn't resonate similar. We wouldn't have been very similar in our response should this have been an actual situation and not a... In fact, anyway, I won't get into that. don't want to step on toes here. So, verse... Well, I do, but not those toes. There's other specific toes I'm looking for. And we're, we're heading to those toes. So we're going to pass that, that one, and we're going to come to this one. Verse 13... 
But he answered and said to them, now this is the landowner who had hired them in the morning. Look at his language. What's the first word out of his mouth? Oh, friend. I love that. That's just so disarming. Oh, friend. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Remind me of our agreement this morning. I've had a busy day. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Uh, well, yeah. Take what is yours and go your way. Now, watch this. I wish, I desire, it brings me pleasure. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. And a question. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or, and here's a, a Jewish idiom, is your eye evil because I am good? And you find that's an idiomatic expression. You go back in the Old Testament, if somebody had an evil eye, I'll give you one instance. In the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible says, if you're wealthy and you own a bunch of vineyards and, uh, and uh, you, have, you have harvested your vineyards and, and others go through, poor people go through, and they glean what you have left. If, left, if you throw them out and you have an evil eye toward them and they pray to me, he basically says, I'll answer their prayer. An evil eye. This is a Jewish idiom for being ungenerous. He says, is your eye evil because I am good? Now, don't miss the basic point. Jesus says here in the parable, what Jesus is saying is that what the people received in this, in this the kingdom of heaven is like parable, the one hour workers, the three hour workers, the six hour workers, the nine hour workers, and the all day workers, that they did not receive what they deserved. They did not receive the reward of labor, but the reward of grace. By the way, that is exactly the title of the chapter in Christ Object Lessons. The reward of grace. They did not get paid because their work was so good, but because the owner was so good. And Jesus says, and fellas, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Because the rich young ruler had approached Jesus thinking, I do for you, you do for me. Hey, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's proportional. Peter had said, hey, you know, we didn't leave everything that you asked the rich young ruler to leave, frankly, because we didn't have it. But we did leave something, and what do we get in return? Because the expectation is, is that God will reward us proportionate to what we put into the equation. And Jesus says, let me tell you, it's nothing like that. You are not rewarded because you are so good. You are rewarded because God is so good. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's not a kingdom based on Keynesian economics or capitalism or democracy. It's a, it's a kingdom based on, what were our three things? On love, grace, and righteousness. And this parable is the perfect articulation of grace and love and righteousness. You don't get what you deserve. You get what Jesus deserved. Amen. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, just a, another word on this, another brief pastoral application. We need to be very clear here. And I, I want to push the boundaries, but I don't want to get in trouble too much. There are people at the front of the line, beloved. And those of us that are further back in the line need not despise those people who need a little more grace than us. And this can manifest itself in a variety of ways. Right? There are some of us that are at the front of the line and because of maybe the, 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 the genetic inheritance that we receive from our parents or our, our cultural idiosyncrasies or maybe our family heritage, whatever it might be, there are some of us that have some, how shall we say, flat sides and rough edges. Some of us have been out and we have gone out and have, have earned, you know, so to speak. We've paid our, our debts to the street, so to speak, and we have earned some bad habits, and we hate those habits. We've earned some ways of res relating to people and responding to people. We have some flat sides. We got issues, some of us, because we didn't have, a great example would be me and my wife. My wife doesn't have the experience that I had. My wife was raised, God bless her, in a third generation Seventh-day Adventist home. She's never had a bite of meat in her life. She, w whenever we play these various trivia games, and it has anything to do with the television or a movie star or sport, she's like, I don't know. She just doesn't, it's just like she doesn't even know who was Harry, uh, who played Indiana Jones. What's Indiana Jones? That's my wife. She doesn't, she doesn't know Harrison Ford. She, doesn't, she, she has no context for understanding that. So my wife, she might be sort of here. And some of us are like, you know, the son of a pastor's pastor's pastor's. Some of us are like, we're, we're like, we are like Adventist royalty at the back of the line. And every one of us needs grace. 
We all need grace. And the person at the front of the line, maybe he doesn't have your exact experience. There, there, there would be an inclination to be prejudiced toward this person because he maybe didn't follow the exact ministerial track that you followed. Oh, I could get off on that. Maybe he didn't go exactly the way you went. Maybe he doesn't believe exactly like you believe. Maybe he has a few little idiosyncratic things. Maybe he is annoying. But give him grace. If God has accepted him, why shouldn't you accept him? I think God's standard is mildly large, uh, higher and, and, and more robust than yours. And so the point is basically this. These people need grace, but so do these, and so do these, and so do these. And you might be thinking, well, what about the 12-hour? The, the people that worked all 12 hours, they didn't get grace. They got what they deserved. No, because they still got hired. You, the landowner was under no obligation to hire them. The point is this. Everybody gets grace. Some need more, some less. And this is exactly what Ellen White's talking about when she says the cultivated and inherited tendencies to evil. Some of us, because of our genetic inheritance and because of the legacy of our families, we're closer to the front of the line. And we are asking those of you who are further back in the line to have gr mercy on us. Have mercy on our various idiosyncrasies. In other words, to begin to view people as God views. And this is what we talked about yesterday in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says we no longer regard any man according to the flesh. We're not going to see them as we're inclined to see them, as our flesh would want to see them. We're going to see them as God sees them because everybody needs grace and everybody gets the same. This is bordering on socialism. I'm sorry. This is... Everybody gets the same. This is the anti-America. Everybody gets the same. Well, it, what used to be the anti-America. I'm sorry. Stop. Stop. <laughs> grace. Grace. Grace, grace, grace. Jesus says, fellas, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. The rich young ruler thought he would receive proportionate to what he had given. Peter thought he would receive proportionate to what he had given. And Jesus says, you don't receive what you deserve. You don't receive because you're so good. You receive because I'm so good and my father is so good. Now, we've got to close this, but we're going to close it in an unusual way. Can you think of another story in scripture? where the, the, somebody was treated with tremendous grace and somebody else was not happy about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's the answer? What's the answer here? Oh, so go to Luke 15. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know. You learned this before I was even a twinkle in my father's eye. I know this, some of you. You know, follow me to the parable of the prodigal son and, and see if it's not possible that for many of us in this room, we had missed the central feature of the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I know that's a bold thing to say in a room of theologians, but just, just, just suffer it to be so for now, okay? <laughs> just try me. Go to Luke 15. Go to Luke 15. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but as you know it, many of you know it. Luke 15, a man has how many sons? How many sons does he have? He has two sons, and uh, one son goes away to Vegas, right? One son goes away to Vegas, and he's, he says, Dad, I'm tired of this place. I'm tired of living on an organic farm, you know, here, 25 miles outside of the city in an outpost center. I hate this place. I'm tired of dressing like this. I, I, I want to live. I want to I go out. I want to see Vegas. I want to... And so the father, uh, uh, reluctantly but willingly, uh, he gives his son uh, the, the, the portion of his inheritance that was his, and he goes off, and he just lives wildly. He just goes off and he does his thing. We don't know how for long, but you get the feeling that there's a significant brevity here, that it just sort of, the money just evaporates reasonably quickly. And uh, in the parable of the story, the other son, we don't know much about him yet, but we, he must have stayed home because Jesus is basically silent about him. So here's this guy, goes off to Vegas. And he's partying, he's doing the, some of us went to Vegas. Anybody in this room went to Vegas? Do we have any, we'll call them Randys. How many Randys do we have here? Oh, come on, any Randys here? Okay, I'm a Randy. There's like, I, yeah, I'm a Randy. Okay, we'll say Randy went off to Vegas. So now we're dealing with Rich Randy, and we're going to say the guy that stayed back is Ronald. So I'm a Randy, and some of us went to Vegas. Some of us went there, and, and we, we made mistakes, and, and we made big mistakes, and, and then we came to ourselves. This Randy finds himself one day, and he's feeding the pigs. He's, he's, he's feeding pigs. This would be the lowest, most menial. You know, Jesus is very intentional about his language here. And the Bible says that while he's feeding the pigs, he comes to himself. He has an epiphany. He has an awareness. And the awareness goes something like this. Wow. Look at how I'm living in squalor. And, and there are servants in my father's house who are living better than I will live. 
I will return to my father. Now, so far you think, oh, we know this parable. I've heard it a hundred times, but watch. Jesus here is absolutely a stroke of, of storytelling brilliance. Watch what he does. So he's letting you know how the young man was thinking as he was preparing to go back to his father. And Jesus rehearses what the man was thinking, the boy was thinking. So pick it up here in verse uh, 17. He's letting you into the mind of the little boy or the young man. But when he had come to himself, verse 17, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise. You can just see him getting the idea. Oh, I know what I'll do. I will arise. I'll go back to my dad's house, and I will say to him, now he's rehearsing what he'll say. Jesus is letting you in. He's, he's opening up the mind of the prodigal, and he's, this is what I will say. Father, two parts. How many parts, everyone? Two parts. Let's pay attention to both of them. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Yeah, that's how I'll start. That's good. I like that. Yeah. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Yeah, I like that. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but there's something missing. You know, I can't, I can't just go back and call him dad. Oh, B part. Here's the B part. Make me like one of your hired servants. Yeah, make me like one of your hired servants. Okay, so the A part is, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. B part is, make me like one of your hired servants. So then the Bible says he returns. He goes back. And there's the father sitting on the porch swing, right? There's the father, and he's... He sees the familiar gait of his son. We all have a gait, right? We all have a way that we walk. My friends are always saying, David, stand up straight. I don't know what it is. I just want to get close to you. Ah. I, I don't know what it is. I just, it's hard for me. It doesn't feel natural. But I'm working on it. I'm working on my posture. I stand up against the wall. My neck starts to kill me. But anyway, have mercy on me. I give my wife a hard time because I tell her that she walks like a duck. You know, she needs to put her toes together because she, she just walks like this. It's like, I mean, that's how she stands. That is so uncomfortable to me. I just saw a guy yesterday in this very building who has the opposite situation. He's got this going on, which is cool, right? You walk like this. And some of us walk, you know, more quickly. And some of us sort of walk more slow. We all have a way about us. Just a way. And the father sees this. He sees that his... And his eyes can't believe it for just a moment. He, that looks like my boy. He continues his reconnaissance and... Sure enough, it's, it's Randy. Without hesitation, the Bible says that he runs. He runs, which is, there's significance here. But he runs to meet his, his boy. And when he gets to the boy, watch this. He gets to the boy. And we'll pick it up here in verse uh, 20. And he arose and he came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And he had compassion. And he ran. And he fell on his neck and kissed him. I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised in a hugging home. I was raised in a hugging home. That's my, my dad just raised me as a hugger. And, you know, it's like, my, you know, it's like, oh, good to see you, boy. You know, just, just, uh, you just I love that about my, my, my father. Just a very hugging person. Some of you weren't raised that way. And uh, I always get a kick out of the, 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 in the Adventist churches, you know, depending on the churches you go to. But in, in many of the Anglo churches, the hugs are so disingenuous. <laughs> they're, they're what I call the A-frame. <laughs> like, what is that? What is that? And you don't, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to give the person the dip, but you know, it's, <laughs> like, I don't understand that. Or we go for this, you know, this is another one, the side, the bumper cars, like, hey, good to see you. He was like bumping people in the foyer. Nice to see you. How are you? Good to, like, what is that? But then, but then you go to the Hispanic churches, right? Oh, hermanito. Right? I mean, it's true, isn't it? Isn't it? And so I was raised in a very physical, you know, touching, you know, the love language is saying what mine is physical touch, right? Like 99% like of other males. Mine is physical touch. And, and so, so that's my, I can just see this in my mind's eye. The father, he just embraces the son. We're going to come back to that. He just embraces him and he holds him because sometimes, sometimes there are things that are ineffable. There, there are things that cannot be said. Sometimes language just fails and you just need to be held. Come on, ladies, yeah? <laughs> me too. I, I, listen, I'm, I'm totally comfortable in my masculinity. I can admit there's sometimes I'll just say to my wife, sweetie, just hold me. Something about just being held. 
The father, the Bible says, wraps him in his arms and he falls on his neck. The imagery here is so rich. But the son, look at the son. He's being, oh, I love you, but it's my granny. And here's the son. Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Right? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now watch this, watch this. I have sinned against heaven and before you. Now this is the point. Don't miss this. One of the points. Look at this, verse 21. Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a, bring a ring and uh, put it on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found, and everyone began to be merry. Do you notice that he doesn't get the B part out? Do you notice that he doesn't get the B part out? The, the speech consisted of two parts. What were the two parts? I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And what was the B part? The B part was, make me like one of your... He never says it. Why does Jesus go into that point? Why does Jesus make that point then? Why does Jesus include this psychological detail if he never actually says it? Because he wants you to know the mentality that the young boy was returning with. The young boy thought he was going to return on his own terms. Dad, 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 just with the hug a second, just hold on. I put together some terms here, and, and I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but perhaps you could make me like one of your hired servants, and um, I will work. Uh, in the beginning, I'll be, I'll be willing to stay in, in the servants' quarters, and uh, I will work hard, dad, and I will show to you that I'm a very good son, and, and I'm sorry for what I've done, and and uh, over time, I'm not suggesting soon, I, I don't want to infer that, Dad, but I, and I know you're upset, but uh, over time I will work and, and I will become increasingly worthy of your respect and honor and I will show you that I am worthy to be called your son. I want to come on as a hired servant. Well, you know, son, you've greatly disappointed your mother and I and um, I'm going to have to, do you have a proposal? Can I see it? Thank you. Um, why don't you uh, pitch a tent on the far hill? And uh, your mother and I will take a look at this. We'll have our legal team examine it. And uh, we will see if the terms of your return are, if, are workable. So uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll text you later today. And, uh, <laughs> right? There's none of this. There's no negotiation. He never even gets to say it. He never even gets to introduce the concept of, of working. Returning on my terms, he is grabbed and embraced. Now, the party's going on. And every, the party, and here comes Ronald. Sweating, just like, the, just like these guys at the back of the line. Oh, man. And he hears the sound, like Joshua and Moses. He hears the sound. Sounds like a party. My birthday's not for another six months, right? So the Bible says he calls one of his servants. He calls the servant over. Now watch this because this is the point. Don't miss this. Hang in here. Just, you've been so gracious. Just hang in here. Verse 26. So he called one of his servants and he said, he asked what these things meant. Oh, you're not going to believe this, Ronald. You're not going to believe this. Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound. He looks terrible. I mean, don't get me wrong. He looks terrible. But, but he's safe and he's sound and your father has killed the fatted calf. Oh, it's awesome. It's Randy's home. Verse 28, but he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Can you see him? I'm not going in there. He's mad. He's a pouty, pathetic excuse for an older brother. He won't go in. He's like, no, 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 Ronald, it's Randy, the servant says. It's Randy and dad and the party. And he's like, I'm not going in there. Go tell dad I'm mad. <laughs> Randy, it's Randy. Remember fishing? Randy sledding? It's your brother. I'm not going in there. Okay, so the servant goes in, and he, he goes to the dad, and the, it's loud, you know, and everybody's dancing, and it's a joyful time. He says, hey, Ronald's here. Oh, great, Ronald's here. And he's outside, and he's, he's, he's mad. Oh, we're all glad. It's great. No, he's mad. He won't come in. Well, why not? I don't know. He's mad. Dad's like, okay. So the dad goes out. He says, hey. Hey, Ronald, how are you doing? What, what's, what's wrong here? Now, look at this. Look at the dialogue here, and don't miss this. He pleaded with him. It's, it's, your, it's your brother, Randy, verse 29. So he said to his father, and watch this. 
This is amazing. Lo, these many years I have been, what does your Bible say? That's right. Serving you. Dad, these many years I've been serving you. And I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, not my brother, as soon as this son of yours, it is such disdain and revulsion for his son, he can't even bring himself to call him his brother. As soon as this son of yours, this pathetic son of yours has come, who devoured your livelihood, translation, my inheritance, with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now look at the astonishment of the father. Now listen, listen as the son ends his diatribe. The father looks at him and says, Son? Is that you, is that you son? I'm sorry, did I hear you say that? You've been serving me? Son? You are always with me. And everything that I have is yours. You mean you were working for a small goat? This place is yours, man. Son? It is right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. We thought that Ronald and Randy were totally different. They're the same. In the way that they related to their father, they're the same. And that's why I'm totally convinced. That's why Jesus included that little psychological window. Make me like one of your hired servants. You see, both Randy and Ronald had a servant-master relationship with their father. Son. All these years I've been a vegan. And let me tell you, it wasn't always easy. All these years I have been keeping the Sabbath. And let me tell you, that wasn't always easy. And all these years I have been reading the writings of Ellen White. All of these years. I never went to a movie theater once, except when March of the Penguins came out. And that was a Sunday matinee. <laughs> all these years I have been serving you. Beloved, don't miss the point. And I don't want to be unnecessary, because you're smart. You'll make the application. Both Randy and Ronald were exactly like Peter and exactly like the rich young ruler. And let's just quickly review. The rich young ruler, you have something I want, I'll do for you, you reward me, and it'll be proportional. Peter, hey, we didn't leave everything he left, but we'll leave the boat, and what do we get in proportional return? Exactly. And then Jesus says, well, it's not like that. In fact, the one, the three, the six, the nine, and the twelve all get the same. Because you're not rewarded because you're so good, but because God is so good. God is rewarding everybody the same. It's the reward of grace. It's what we learned yesterday. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. And then we mourn that condition. We have an attitude of meekness. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We have the experience of mercy. Our heart becomes purified as we reach out to others. We become peacemakers. Blessed are those that are persecuted, for theirs is what? Same thing. It doesn't matter if you're nailed to a tree or you're being persecuted because you're so spirit-filled. You get the same reward. And in the parable of the prodigal son, the son believes that he is going to work his way back. It's going to be proportionate. Why does Jesus include that psychological detail? Because he wants you to know that both Randy and Ronald had the same basic attitude toward their dad. And that was, I will work and you will reward me accordingly. It's proportionate. So there's this um, parable. That scholars say, and I'm, I'm not somebody to know this, but this is in several places I've read this parable, that suggests that this, scholar, this, this parable that I'm going to read you right now was contemporaneous with the days of Jesus. Contemporaneous with the days of Jesus. It was a rabbinical parable. Now, the question is, is was the parable uh, 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 reactionary to what Jesus said or was what Jesus said a response to the parable? And most believe, the ones that I read said... Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 20 about the people that all get paid the same was a response to this rabbinical parable I'm going to read you right now. Tell me if you hear the similarities. A king hired workmen to work in his vineyard. One of the men worked skillfully. And the king took him by the hand and spent most of the day talking with him. And when the laborers were paid, 
This man received the same as the others. Do you hear the similarities? It's an identical, basically. This man received the same as the others. But they grumbled and said, We have toiled all the day, whereas this man toiled for two hours. And yet the king has given him his full wage. The king said to them, Now this is the rabbinical parable that Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 20 was probably a response to. Listen to, Je- listen to the rabbinical parable. The king said to them, what cause do you have for grumbling? Why are you grumbling and complaining? This man in two hours did more good work than you did in the whole day. Do you see these radically, fundamentally different systems of understanding how God works here? The Jewish parable tells the classic meritocracy. This guy accomplished more in two hours than you accomplished in 12. That's why I paid him better. Because he's a better worker. He's done more for me and I rewarded him accordingly. Stop your grumbling. Jesus says, well, let me tell you, it's not like that at all. You don't get rewarded because you are so skillful and you are such a crafty artisan and because you are so sanctified and because you, whatever it is, you don't get rewarded because you are so good. Jesus' parable says you get rewarded because God is so good. It's God who is so good. And beloved, if this is the case, and I hope and pray that it, I I believe that it is, at least that's what the the several commentaries that I was able to get access to said, that, that this, Jesus tells his parable to purposely undercut this basic rabbinical understanding of how salvation works, how a relationship works between God and man. It's not economical. It's not capitalist. We are accepted by God because of who Christ is and because of who God is. And what we bring to the table is a pittance. Some of us bring, some of us bring nothing. We've been working for a measly hour. We get the same. Some of us are further back in the line. And hallelujah, I hope that that is the case for you. Second, third, fourth generation Adventist, on fire, spirit filled, preaching with Bob Falkenberg all over the world and baptizing. I hope that is you. But in the event that it's not, And you're at the front of the line. You're an 11th hour worker. You don't get what you deserve. It's the reward of grace. There are two possible responses, three possible responses today. One is the response of the prodigal. I went to Vegas and I'm coming back and I'm going to prove that I'm worthy of being in your house, oh God. The second response is I never left and I've been serving you all of these years. The Randy response and the Ronald response. The third response is the biblical response. It's the gospel response. It's the response of a kingdom built on grace and love and righteousness. It's we come to God just as we are. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm just going to, I'm, I, I email my good friend Bill, not, he's been having some pain, so he's, he's not here. Um, and I just said, Bill, I just need, I just, just help me out. Just guide me here. What do I preach? I don't feel comfortable standing up in front of these dear people and casting a vision for the world church. David's vision for the church. I I barely can tie my shoes in the morning. I'm glad that God has called you. I have ideas. Some of them good. Some of them you might not think not so good. But I, I I said, Bill, I don't feel comfortable standing up in front of these men many of and women, many of whom are my seniors in ministry by years and 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 educating them and coming in. He said, preach to them. They're just ordinary people. With the various struggles and, and, and vicissitudes and, and, and weaknesses and temptations that every church member preached. And I love what he said. God bless you, Bill. I hope you don't mind me saying this. He said, preach to them just like you would preach to a church and say, Omaha. And you'll be perfectly fine. So, Nebraskans, this is what I would preach. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to suggest, I'm going to go out on a limb here as a preacher. Somebody who's been in full-time ministry now for 15 years. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb because I know myself and I'm going to imagine that it's possible that there are other people here who have been in ministry or who have been associated with ministry for years who still need the grace of Jesus Christ in the most fundamental way. I'm going to suggest that there might even be some prodigals here. I think that's possible. I think it's absolutely possible to be working at the General Conference and have your heart be in Vegas. I think it's possible. 
I told you I was going to make an appeal, so you knew it was coming. So don't even, don't, don't do the, oh, I've got a text, I've got to get, you can't, it's, don't leave now. This is the time you're going to listen. When Ellen White tells this in Christ's Object Lessons, when she tells these three parables, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Check me on this. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. She does something very interesting. I never noticed it before. I just read it on the plane. In each parable, she concludes it, it, with different language. And the, the, her conclusion is, is that the individual, the sheep, the coin, and the prodigal is wrapped in the arms of its finder. That's the language she uses. She says the sheep, bruised and injured, is wrapped in the arms of the shepherd. The coin that is found is held to the bosom of the woman. And the prodigal that is recovered is wrapped in the arms of the father and he falls on his neck and kisses him. In each instant, she closes with being held by God. Now, because I don't want to be perfectly precise, because sometimes precision, we, we were like, okay, I could respond now, I could respond now. I could, okay, whew, that doesn't apply to me. I don't have to go forward. Whoo! I'm going to keep it nice and broad here. Some of us are Randy's. Elements of Vegas still in the heart. We'll clean that up tomorrow. Some of us are Ronald's. Some of us have the prodigal perspective. Some of us have the pathetic pouty older brother perspective. Some of us have the Peterine perspective. Some of us have the Richard young, rich young ruler perspective, Richard's perspective. But all of us, all of these fundamentally are the same. That at some level, the reward I get is proportionate and what I do at the end of the day is what matters. So, all those who have a, deep, a sense of their deep soul poverty or in spirit, all who have a sense of their deep soul poverty, who feel that they have nothing good in themselves, may find righteousness and strength by looking unto Jesus. Today we're talking about righteousness, tomorrow about strength. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He bids you exchange your poverty for his riches of grace. We are not worthy of God's love, but Christ our surety is worthy and is abundantly able to save all who shall come unto him. Now listen to this language. Whatever may have been your past experience. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Some of us just need to hear that this morning. By the way, the past is as early as yesterday. I want to say that again. The past is as early as yesterday. Whatever may have been your past experience, the language whatever communicates anything. Oh man, there's some hearts in here that need to hear that. I just sense whatever may have been your past experience. Listen to the words of Jesus this morning. However discouraging your present circumstances, if you will come to Jesus... Just as you are. You can't come to Jesus as you aren't. You can only come as you are. Because he knows. Whatever your past experience, however discouraging your present circumstances, if you will come to Jesus just as you are weak. Do we have any weak people here this morning? <sighs> weak helpless and despairing. I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that there might be some people in this very room who are in the midst of despair in their own spiritual experience. I believe that that is absolutely possible even in the bosom of the GC. Weak, helpless, and despairing. Look at this. Our compassionate Savior will meet you a great way off. He sees you walking. And here it comes. He will throw about you, look at this, his arms of love and his robe of righteousness. He presents us to the Father, clothed in the white raiment of his own character. He pleads before God on our behalf, saying, I have taken the sinner's place. Look not upon this wayward child, 
but look on me. And then Ellen White asks the question, does Satan plead loudly against our souls, accusing of sin and claiming us as his prey? I want to ask you that question this morning. Does Satan plead loudly against your soul, accusing you of sin and claiming you as his prey? The blood of Jesus, she says, pleads with greater power. Some of us this morning, the Riches, the Ronalds, and the Randys, and the Peters, have something in our lives that we just need to be held this morning by the arms of Jesus. And you know what it is. I told you, I mentioned just yesterday, and I'm not going to get into details, about three months ago I went through a period of what, what could only be described as a spiritual malaise, a spiritual funk. I can say this. The nature of this malaise was such that if you knew the details, I would be totally embarrassed to stand in your presence. Jesus has rescued me from that. That wasn't the first time, by the way. That, 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 that's, and I hope it was the last. But I'm just going to beg you today, if this message has resonated with you, the Randys, the Ronalds, the Riches, or the Peters, and there's something and you've thought, you know what, that, that is scratching right where I'm itching. The Spirit of God has spoken to you today. Secretary, security, general conference president, general conference vice president, NAD worker, ADRA worker, AWR, doesn't matter. Today, today, we're all just sons and daughters of God. And sometimes, even the preachers just need to be held. And so the appeal this morning is if the Spirit of God has spoken to you and you have something very specific in your life that you need to surrender, some perspective, some attitude, and any of these elements apply to you. And this morning you need the reassurance. The, the reassurance. It's not the reassurance of a pastor or of an emotion. It's the biblical reassurance that the arms of Christ are thrown around you. The arms of the Father are thrown around you. And though Satan plead loud, pleads loudly against your soul, this morning you just need to be held in the arms of Jesus and you need to cling to that truth that the blood of Jesus pleads with greater power. As Matthew sings this beautiful song, I'm going to invite those of you to, who want to respond to that to come forward and receive, as it were, the embrace of God. This would be the time to come. Love is not proud. Love does not boast. Love after matters the most love does not run love does not hide love does not keep locked inside love is the river that flows Love never fails Love will sustain Love will provide Love will not cease at the end of time Love will protect, love always hopes, and love still believes when you don't. Love is the arms that are holding you, love never fails you. My heart won't make a sound 
when I can't turn back around when the sky is falling down nothing is greater than this greater than this cause love is right here love is alive Love is the way, the truth, the light. Love is the river that flows through. Love is the arms that are holding you. And love is a place you will fly away to. Love never fails. Father in heaven, it is our great privilege to call you Father. It is our great privilege to be held this morning in the embrace of grace. Father, I want to pray for the 12 hour workers, for those that have been faithful, stood with you and for you and in you and by you. Uphold them with your righteous right arm, Father. Keep them strong as Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego of old. Buoy them in the various departments, Father. Give us pillars and men and women of principle, strength, integrity, and compassion. Give them skill, give them vision, give them organization, give them courage, give them awareness, give them discernment. Father, I pray for our 12-hour workers among us today. We've all been 12-hour workers at one time. And Father, today I also pray for the one-hour workers. I want to pray for that person who only barely got out of bed this morning. Father, I know they're here. I saw some of them yesterday in the office. I want to pray for that person who is struggling with the tear-stained cheek who has been receiving the brunt of the attacks of the enemy. person this morning who woke up feeling unworthy of your love. Father, help the one hour worker this morning to receive the denarius of grace from your hand. Father, to receive the embrace and the robe of the righteousness of Christ. Help them to return as son and daughter. And Father, for everyone in between, those of us who are a mix of the principled and the prodigal, those of us who have allowed perhaps some laziness, some lackadaisicalness, some recklessness, Father, those of us who have not guarded every door, we've guarded most of the doors, but that one door was left open. Father, I pray for everybody in between, the three, the six, the nine. We stand before you today, uh, an assembly of Richards and Ronalds and Randys, of Peters. And Father, today we have heard the words of Christ. The kingdom of heaven is built on different principles. Love and righteousness, grace. I want to pray, Father, for that person today who is tempted to utter discouragement and despair. I want to pray for that person against whom Satan is pleading loudly and claiming him or her as his prey. Father, today they have come. May they hear the words that have been spoken directly to their soul and to their situation. 
the blood of Jesus pleads with greater power. The blood of Jesus pleads with greater power. Let's say that together. The blood of Jesus pleads with greater power. Father, we believe that today. And in our recitation, we claim that promise by faith. Pray for all of the prodigals and all of the pouties in this building. Father, make us better than that. Save us. We receive today by faith the robe of righteousness. Father, we also receive today the ring of standing. We believe that we stand not as we should, but as we do in Christ. Put us to work, not to gain or to earn but to serve and to love. And revive us, Father. That's what we need. In the embrace of the Father and in the embrace of the Son, revive us to live for you. In Jesus' name, let all of the Randys, the Roberts, the Ronalds, and the Peters say, Amen. Amen. Turn to the brother or sister next to you. Just give them a word of encouragement. Tell them Jesus loves them.